Today we light the candle of faith. Luke 1, verse 35 reads, And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. <clears throat> verse 38 tells of Mary's response to the angel. Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. On this second week of Advent, we focus on faith, the faith of a young couple chosen by God for a history-changing task. Seldom does God break into the routine of young lives to ask for such total self-denial, such blind agreement to an uncharted course. We stand in awe of Mary and Joseph as they drop all hopes and dreams to follow the plan of God for their future. We too should have faith that God will show himself strong when we trust and follow him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we recognize that your plans for our lives may differ from other plans and dreams. You know our hearts and our innermost thoughts. We fear taking great risk with the only life you have given us. We ask for faith to follow you as you include our lives in your large plan of history. We ask for courage to walk the way you design and for assurance that your will is our best choice and our greatest fulfillment. Help us to follow you as Jesus followed you. Amen. That passage that Grayson and June shared with us about God overshadowing Mary and the changing of the plans, that's whenever I look at a nativity set um, pastors look at nativity sets different than y'all do. We go, that's historically inaccurate. There's no wise men there. They came much later. You know, that's not what it probably looked like. It's probably more like a, you know, we just tear it apart. Um, there's a nativity set up here. And every time I look at nativities now, I, I do what Grayson talked about. I'm so glad he shared that. And that wasn't even planned. Um, God is an interrupter of our plans. And you won't know him more intimately unless you can allow him not only to interrupt your plans, but to walk with him as he reveals his plans to you. This nativity set up here, uh, Sheila Loving called me a while back, and then she got in touch with the church. And um, this is Patty Loving's. And uh, Sheila said, does the church want it? And I didn't even pray about it. I said, Yes. And so we have Patty with us this, this Christmas with her nativity. And I'm hoping this will be a tradition that we'll have because we have one out here that was given to us and now we have another. And I pray that when we look at that, we will not only remember Patty, but we'll remember that God is an interrupter of our plans because he knows the plans he has for us and it's different from ours because he's got a bigger goal. And so as we start the message this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for memories. I thank you for photos. I thank you for times that we can be reminded that you are a God who comes into our life not just to change it, but to redirect it. And Father, much of what's going on in our world today is a people who refuse to let you be a part of their life. And so we will reap what we're sowing. And Father, I know even for myself, there's times that you come into our life and interrupt it in ways that we do not understand and it is hard. And I just pray that the message today will help encourage some as they have had their lives interrupted. Father, we've been praying for many people and I pray that we would spend time today with you praying about ourselves and where we are with you. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people said... Amen. How many of y'all like Christmas music? <sighs> I have a hard time with Christmas music. Now, there's some that I like, and it's not the ones you think I would like. Um, Casting Crowns has some great stuff. Chris Tomlin, some other people. Um, I like some of the Dean Martin stuff. Baby, it's cooled outside. I like that. And, and uh, 
you know, some of those things. Um, but Christmas music's really taken a turn, hasn't it? Everything from Grandma got run over by a reindeer, and Mr. Grinch. And, but, you know, the thing about Christmas music, I don't know if you've noticed this, it's very depressing, some of it. And some of it's very sentimental. And I don't know if you've ever realized what the first Christmas carol was, but it's in your Bible. And I'm hoping I got this right because my Bible's at home. I just have my notes. It's Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 56. That's where we're going to be at today. We're going to look at the first Christmas song. Uh, Mary, as, as June and Grayson have read, she was met by Gabriel. And he said, you are going to be with child. Now, she hasn't been with a man. She asked, how can this be? And he said, the Lord's going to overshadow you. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. You'll be with child. Uh, a divine, immaculate conception. It was also a prophecy from the Old Testament that would be a sign that this one that comes from a virgin would be the Messiah, the one that would save the world. Uh, Mary, a woman of great faith, said, let it be to me according to your word. She had tremendous trust. And Mary was blessed. Many, we have a lot of Catholics that come here. Um, we've had a lot of people that join our church from the Catholic tradition. And um, Mary's a big deal in the Catholic church. Matter of fact, if you want to talk to Jesus, you have to go through who? Mary. Now, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible said there's one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus Christ. So we can pray directly to him. And at least if I know my, my wife grew up Catholic, so I don't want you to think I'm bashing in any way. But she's blessed above women. Amen? That's not what the Bible says what the Catholic Church says. The Bible reveals she's blessed among women. And God came to her not because she was special, not because she was holy, not because she was more pure than anybody else. He came to her because he had a plan and she was going to be part of his plan and he invited her to be a part of that plan. And she is a woman of faith because she says, let it be done to me according to your word. There's other times even in the Christmas story where God comes to people and they go, no. And the angel says, well, because you didn't believe God, you'll just be quiet until the baby's born. You won't be able to speak. This song, if you'll look, starts at verse 46. Mary just receives this news. She goes to a relative and it says, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant for behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength in his arms. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty." He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. And Mary remained with her for about three months, talking about with her relative, and then returned to her home. Now, when we use the word blessed, you hear all kinds of definitions of blessed. If I say, what does blessed mean? Some people will say, well, that's when everything's good in life. All things is just, everything's just working well. We know you're blessed. So we pull up to Walmart and the as we're pulling in, somebody's pulling out right in the front, and we go, oh, God loves me. I'm blessed among women. <laughs> Everything's right with the world, so I know that I am what? Blessed. And, and so some people look at blessed that way. Um, some look at it as you've got God's favor. Are you blessed? Has God blessed you? You know, has God's favor rested on you? Are you one of the best ones? Some people look at blessed that way. No one looks at blessed biblically. Matter of fact, we even use blessed in bad ways. Bless their heart. Y'all laugh because you know what that means. What does that mean? You don't even want to say it because you're in church. Just bless their heart. Listen, when the Lord comes to Mary, he sends his angel Gabriel. And when the angel speaks, it says, having come in, the angel said to her, rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Now, what does that word blessed mean? He goes on to say, well, the scripture says, but when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what 
manner of greeting this was. And then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Mary has favor with God and is blessed of God. What does blessed mean? Blessed biblically is something very interesting and is something that this generation is searching for. They're quitting their jobs for. They're leaving their spouses for. They are looking for blessed. The biblical definition of blessed is a very interesting word. It doesn't mean that she was a favorite or blessed above everybody else. This is something that's going to happen. Now, I want to put this in the context so you understand this. Mary is probably on the youngest age that scholars talk about. The youngest, probably around 12 to 15. The oldest, 17. She's engaged to a man from another place. So just for the sake of illustration this morning to help us understand, she's betrothed, she's engaged to a man that lives in Richmond. And in a Jewish wedding, what he'll do is on the wedding day, he will come, he will take her. There will be this great party. Uh, I believe it's a week-long party, and they celebrate that. And then he takes her to the home that he has built for her, and the union becomes complete. Y'all know what I'm talking about. She's now pregnant. And she hadn't seen him. And she's in a small town, so you know what happens in small towns. The rumor historically was she had slept with a Roman soldier. And that's how she got pregnant. That even continued after Jesus died on the cross, that rumor. If you read your Bible carefully, you'll notice that Jesus is kind of referred to as the bastard boy. That's not Joseph's son. So she's 17. Her reputation is, is now about to be ruined forever. Matter of fact, the crime in the nation of Israel of being pregnant this way could get you killed. He could have gone to the elders and said, I have not laid with her. She has done this. She's pregnant. And they would have taken her to the gate and stoned her. But Joseph loves her. He's a very gracious man. He's a godly man. We know this from the scripture as well. And he loved her. He didn't want to do that to her, but he can't entrust himself to her either. Do you think she was looking forward to that day? Now that's been ruined. Oh, listen, the angel didn't tell Joseph right away. It's months later. She's pregnant. Her reputation's ruined. The wedding's definitely ruined. Rumors are all over the place. And Mary's going to endure this forever. And listen, her, her reputation wasn't ruined so much by others. God did it. God could have done this any other way. He didn't have to do it the way he did. But he came to her and said, this is what's going to happen. Now, we know the baby is God. We know God with us. Jesus is all God and all man. We know that. It fulfills the prophecy from the Old Testament. We know that. But can you imagine them? Can you imagine mom and dad? Sweetie, how did this happen? An angel came to me and told me it just was going to happen. Right. So even if she tells the truth, people say what? <coughs> Bless her heart. That's what they're saying. She's loose. She's a liar. She's all alone. And on top of that, she's dirt poor. Now, we know she's dirt poor because when Jesus does come, the law says you're supposed to offer a sacrifice. And you're supposed to offer a sacrifice for the firstborn male it's to be a lamb. They can't afford that. They do two turtle doves, which was an exception made for poor people. Now, if you're looking at her life, would you say she's blessed? No. See, we equate the love of God on how well our life is going. That's why when we get thrown curveballs or bad things happen, we shake our fists and go, why have you done this? But she's blessed. The word blessed, the Beatitudes, how does it start? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are, blessed. That word blessed simply means this, happy. You're going to be happy among women. That's what it is in the Greek. 
So when somebody gets a job, they get out of college and they work. I met with some college kids this week because they're getting on break and stuff. And, and this is my question I ask them. How's the adult life coming? They do not say, oh, it's blessed. <laughs> they go, oh, man, I wish I could go back to middle school. Man, I wish I could go back to high school. When they were in high school, you know what they were saying? Man, I can't wait to get into college and get out of the house. Now they're out of college and out of the house. and They're going, oh, I wish I could go back. We are a nation that pursues happiness. Would you agree? That's why some people, let me tell you something I've noticed, at least in Tappahanna. Young say it's like this everywhere. I don't think it is. I'm not happy with her, so I'm going to go be with her. I'm not happy with him, so I'm going to go be with him. And they're pursuing what? Happiness. I was talking to somebody the other night. This is the third time Mr. Wonderful has went to go find happiness. And, and the girl saying, oh, he's changed. I don't think so. He's pursuing what? Happiness. And, and just let me share you, with you just something. People who are lonely and empty and drowning in their own selfishness, when they find somebody that's going to make them happy, will cling and suffocate them and drain the very life out of them. Would you agree? Because they're like Jerry Maguire. You complete me. You will make me happy. You will make me happy. And so they join a new union. And guess what? They realize they're not going to make me. So they go, oh, there she is. There's the one that's going to make me happy. I'm sorry. I love you. But I do love you. I'm just not in love with you because I'm in love with them. And they'll go try to find some what? Am I meddling this morning? Let me tell you this, a lonely, insecure, bitter single person, you know what happens when they get married? They're a lonely, insecure, bitter married person because nobody's ever going to cure your happy problem. Only the creator who made you can help you with your happy problem. And people will try in vain, and we're all guilty of it, including the pastor, everybody here, we all try to fill that hole in our life that God's supposed to fill and to bring about that blessedness we try to fill it with other things. We try to fill it with ministry. We try to fill it with people. We try to fill it with party. We try to fill it with money. And we will pursue happiness. And it will elude us if we're not looking for happiness in Jesus Christ. Listen, Mary has everything going wrong. And yet she's rejoicing and she says, my spirit has rejoiced in God, my savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. Look, she knew, listen, when things are going really bad and, and I want to clear up some things. Well, we'll just get there in a minute. When things are going really, really bad and we're looking for relief, the last place we look is God. Would y'all agree? We'll look for a bottle. We'll look for a pill. We'll look for a girlfriend or a boyfriend. And let me tell you, if your girlfriend or boyfriend is the answer to your happy problem, you just look at your watch because it's just a matter of time before that implodes on itself. Because God's not going to compete. We're all looking for happiness. Now, the reason she can remain happy with all this bad thing is because she has two things going for her. One, she knows the promises of God. And she has the presence of God. Let me explain that because this is what we need to look for for this personal, intimate relationship that God desires with us. She knew the promises of God. She alludes to that in the song with Abraham. 2,000 years before this, there was a promise made that there would be one that would come that's going to bless the entire world. It's going to bless all the nations of the earth. And, and this promise comes thousands of years before Mary's on the scene. Now, what we forget is for 400 years, God hasn't spoken at all. There's been no prophet. There's been no word. There's been no revelation of God. It's been quiet. God has been quiet for 400 years. That's a long time. How old is our country? And all of a sudden, God has broken through. Before this, he shows up at the temple and speaks. 
And now he sent his messenger to speak to Mary. And Mary knows in light of this, God's plan is coming true. God hasn't forgotten about these promises. God is doing something he promised to do. And there's a greater blessing coming than we've ever dreamed. And God has invited me to be a part of that. And in the same way, God has been working. Listen, this is for all of us. God has been working in your life as well. Sometimes behind the scenes, sometimes silently, but in mysterious ways, he's been working to bring you to Jesus. He wants to bring Jesus into your life, and he's been working very hard at that. And sometimes it may feel like he's forgotten you, just like Israel felt that way, but he hasn't. Sally Lloyd-Jones says this, when God promises to bless you, he is saying, I'm going to make you into everything I've ever meant you to be. It means that God is taking every day and every single thing that happens in it, good or bad, to make you stronger, to mend whatever is broken inside of you, to change you into the person you were always meant to be. And so when God came in and interrupted, he's trying to build a relationship. He's building trust. He's trying to break down things in our lives that are destroying us and hurting us. He's trying to bring about a blessing. Mary didn't... Mary didn't waver like we do. She really trusted God. Being blessed and highly favored does not mean living a life without suffering or bad situations. It means I have the presence of God and his promises that God gives me in these situations. It means I have a life in which God is committed to conforming me toward the image of his son, Jesus Christ, and helping others come to see him in us. Let me clear up two things so there's not a misunderstanding. I am not saying God causes all the suffering. Sometimes sin and evil does that. Amen or oh me. But God says I'm directly involved even in that and I will work all things together for a good because I have a plan and I'm directing it sovereignly. And I'm not saying that God doesn't give good gifts on earth. There's times he blesses us with great things. He says, I know that this is from Psalm 27, 13. I know that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. How many of y'all have been blessed beyond what y'all deserve? Raise your hand. Look, every, look, that's how we are. And God wants us to extend that blessing. And he does that. But so very often it's these appointments with hard things and interruptions that draws us to God. And Mary knew the promises and knew that it was going to be fulfilled, and it overshadowed everything else. Let me ask you this. Does God overshadow the bad in your life? Because he's trying to bring about, listen, he's trying to bring about happiness. I remember there's been times in my life, and God does it over and over and over. It's, it scares me, even to this day. There's times some things will be going so well and so good, or I'll get really close to someone, and it's so good. And there's a part of me inside that does this. I'm just going to be honest with you, very transparent. There's a part of me inside that does this. Oh, God, please don't take this away. Please don't do this. Don't take this away. This is so good. And sometimes God comes in and says, son, the reason you're asking for that is because you know I'm going to take it away. Now, why does God do that, Linda? Because I may have a blind spot, and the thing I think is going to help me may actually end up hurting me. Or the thing that I'm pouring, I'm pouring all my love and affection and attention to is drawing me away from God. Or it could be that God is trying to open my eyes to a bigger reality. Let me just share, you know, me and my wife are doing really, really well. So thank you for praying for us. A lot of it was the medicine she was on. Now, if you ask her, she'll tell you the same thing. It's almost like we're back where we were. But this summer, when I was at my darkest, and I'll just be honest with you, I didn't have a whole lot of people I could confide in. And, and people that weren't on this, have never been on this medicine, don't know what it's like. Um, she got up to take Mia away so that we can talk about her. I'm talking. Oh, uh, she's up there. <laughs> Busted. No, but, um, you know, part of the darkest problem that I had was, and, and I'm, I'm going to, I won't say the name, but I had somebody that just hit me in the head with a two by four with truth that I needed and they didn't even know it. God used them in a powerful way in my life. But when everything was going South, this is what, this is what I did. God, are you seriously doing this too? Was it not enough that we couldn't have kids? What's talking? Is that bitterness or love talking? 
God, is it not enough that you came in and wrecked this part too? Is it not enough that we had to move? We had our house paid for. We were living pretty good. Is that not enough? Are you going to keep taking things? How much is too much? When is it going to stop? God, why are you doing this? I can't handle this. And what he was saying that I couldn't hear is because I love you and I want you happy. See, some of y'all are there. And this doesn't resonate with you because it didn't resonate with me when people were trying to tell me. But coming out on the other end, you can start to see that God had a what? A plan. And God was showing me things about my life that I didn't see. And there are things that need to be in my life in order for me to have some happy, to be blessed. I was, I was working way too hard. Look at my family for a second. How hard do I work? Very. And God came in and said, this needs to stop. You're not doing this for the right reasons. I didn't have any support group outside of my family. I'll say, why do you use your family as illustrations? You and my family is it. That's all I've got in life. What's my hobby, Michelle? She's laughing. What do I do for fun, Nikki? That was her answer. Shook her head and just, hmm. And listen, church, that's okay. But God has come into my life and said, that is not okay. And so he let me go through this bad spell. That's what he's doing with Mary. The difference between me and Mary is I got very bitter and I got angry at God. She allowed God to overshadow the bad. And she said, let it be done according to your word. Because God, I know you love me so much and I know you're keeping your promises and I've got your presence with me. That's the second part. And if I have your presence, I have your promises. That's all I need. She's not rejoicing in what God has given her like we do. She's rejoicing that God has become what God has become to her in Christ. See, I heard a sermon this week. We equate love with comfort and blessings. And when I say blessings, I mean things. If all is good with my life and everything I'm asking for is coming true and I have everything that I need and I don't have any worries, then God must love me. And therefore I can be what? Happy. But if God came to us today and said, I'm going to take everything. You have a choice. You can have all of me or all of what you have, I'm going to take everything you have, your kids, your home, your wife, your everything. I'm going to take all of that, and all you can have is me. Some of us would really struggle with that. Amen or oh me. I know I would struggle with some of that. Mary desires the presence of God more than that. That's why she's blessed. And she says, for he who is mighty has done great things for me. The whole, and holy is his name, and his mercy is on those who fear him. See, people have this misunderstanding about the word holy. They think it's either really religious people or crazy people. Um, holy. Holy means wholeness. It means perfection. It's perfectly, perfectly perfect. Everything is what it is to be. And a holy person is someone who is whole in God and is perfect, or I shouldn't say perfect, they're not perfect. They hate sin. Their relationship is the key. They're, they walk in integrity and honesty and love. They're reflecting Christ. That's what a holy person is. Listen, if you're truly a holy person, people will be drawn to you. You say, no, you won't. Were they drawn to Jesus Christ? Did they seek Jesus Christ? Who sought Jesus Christ? Sinners did. The religious people killed him. But sinners were drawn. Listen, if your life, if you're not drawing sinners to yourself, you may not be as holy as you think. Because Jesus was a friend of what? Sinners. Now, let me share something with you. Sinners didn't sit around Jesus very long before they were transformed into saved sinners. Transformed sinners. What's a holy marriage? That's where a husband and wife, they love and serve each other and, and desire to to be all that God wants him to be. That's what holy, and see, listen, God is holy, which means he's perfectly, perfectly perfect. There's no corruption. And see, we get used to sin. 
Some of us are so sin laden we can't even see it. We think sin are the things we watch and the things we listen to and the cuss words people say. Pride is a sin. Self-righteousness is a sin. Cowardice is a sin. We just get used to it. God never gets used to it. And Mary recognized that in order for me to have this relationship, I've got to be holy like he is holy, and I am not. And so then she sings about the praise of his mercy, which means God looked at us in compassion and saw how sinful and selfish we are. And he couldn't just let us perish. He wanted to save us. Listen, you can talk bad about me. You can slander me. You can slash the tires in my car. I'm not going to get upset. But you attack my girls, God help you. Now, why is that? You can spit in my face, I'm okay. You spit in Nikki's face, y'all may be posting bond for me. Why is Because I love my what? My children, and I love my wife, and I love Mia. I can handle things, but I can't handle it when it happens to them. And God says the love that I have for them is evil compared to the love he has for them. That's crazy. That's the kind of love God has for sinners. He saw our sinfulness. He says we were enemies of his by nature. And we opposed all that he stood for. We're selfish and self-centered and self-righteous. Listen, who's your worst enemy? Who would you like to see really get it? Don't say names. Who would you really like to see get it? That you really just want to see justice fall on. Now think of that person and say this. I'm going to adopt them and bring them home to live with me, to take care of them and to bless them and to love them the rest of their life. Can you do that? That's what God does for you the sinner. While we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. And that's why she says he's mighty. Because he's holy, he had to do something about our sin. Because he's merciful, he wanted to do something about our sin. And because he's mighty, he was able to do something. There's only one thing in the entire Bible that says, is the power of God. There's many things that talks about by his power he did. He split the Red Sea by what? His power. He shut the lion's mouth by his power. He raised Jesus from the dead by the glory of the Father through his power. God is, by the, he put the universe in place with his words and his fingers by his power. But there's only one thing in the entire Bible that says, is the power of God. Do y'all know what it is? The gospel is the power of God. He said it took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang the world in space. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love and grace. And if you think you're too guilty for God to forgive you, God says, I'm going to reveal my power my presence and my promise by what I'm bringing into this world. Mary treasured God because she not only knew he was real, she knew he loved her and he knew the power of God because it overshadowed her. And she was joyful and blessed and nothing could take it away. I don't have time this morning. I was going to show you a picture of me at Christmas with the, I found the picture. Me and my mom went through all these pictures the other night trying to find that one picture. I'm not even going to use it. It's me at the bottom of the Christmas tree with the Batmobile, Batman and Robin and Spider-Man sitting on the hood. And I was ecstatic. It was under the tree. Mia went to ask Santa for her Christmas stuff. And it was so funny. She got all excited and she asked him all the stuff. She forgot the thing she wanted most. She didn't realize it until after she left. And she said, I forgot to ask Santa. We don't, we talk about the spirit of Santa. If you're struggling with Santa and as, as, as a Christian at Christmas, you come talk to me. I've got an answer for you. The way to do it right. We talked about the spirit of Santa in our home. The spirit of Santa is going to get that present, amen or oh me. It's going to happen. Where's she at? Is she here? Don't worry, Mia. She's going, he's going to get it. 
I celebrated and basked in the presence of that gift under the tree. And that is all I played for the rest of the year. I loved it. It wasn't until I was older that I understood the gift bearer's heart. Many years later. You see, that was the hot Christmas present that year. That was the one everybody was standing in line for for hours to get. That was the one that they were sold out all over the place. And the gift bearer, the one that gave that gift, went out that week or the week before. It was near the end. He looked, up, looked for it up until Christmas. He looked for it right up to Christmas Eve. They were sold out everywhere. The reason I couldn't unwrap that present was because the one who bought the gift begged and bribed to buy the display. So when I looked under the tree for the first time, there was something that wasn't wrapped. But my joy in what was given was wonderful. I, I basked in the presence. As I grew older and found out the heart of the one that got that gift, I now bask in his presence because he loved me enough to do that. Church, sometimes we are so caught up in trying to get gifts from the giver that we have missed the heart of the giver and the extreme he has gone through to have a relationship with you. He has sought you. He has drawn you. He has allowed things to come into your life to get you to come to him. He has sent people into your life to tell you. He has put Bible verses and songs and things in your life over and over and over again because he so desires to give you a gift. And we're just looking for happy. And church, we can't be happy at Christmas until we fully understand the heart of the giver and what he feels towards you. There is no better love on this planet than when somebody is concerned about you, understands you, seeks you, accepts you, loves you, and cherishes you and sends his most precious gift to die for you so you can be one with him. Our world is seeking that. And they're looking at it in bubbas and bubettes and bottles, barbiturates, but they're not coming to Christ because they're blinded. And Christian, we might be missing Christmas because we're more concerned about what God's going to give us instead of the heart that loves us. God so loves Linda and Alan, Michelle and Debbie that he gave you everything so that you can have his presence and his promise that you can be blessed no matter what you're facing. Amen. If I can have my deacons come forward. While they're serving, I'm going to read a scripture to you and share a thought as they're coming back down. The Bible says, For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. When I was in that dark time this summer, and I was going, God, you know, how much are you going to ask of me? How much, how much, how much, how much? I had a friend that texted me. They didn't know I was struggling with all that. They had no clue. I didn't share that with anybody. It's the first time I've really shared it, I believe. And you know what they said in the text? They said, Larry, you have been through so much. You couldn't have kids. And God brought you two wonderful kids. You've had cancer. You've had God provide, and they listed all the things God had done for me. And I needed this. They kicked me in the butt and they said this, you have forgotten who you are and you have forgotten the, the truths of what God has shared with you. You know what I had forgotten? 
I've forgotten my father's heart. If he loved me so much to die for me and he loves me so much to do all that he's done for me, why did I think during that time he'd forgotten me? I got tricked. That friend kind of pulled me back. And as we take this, what we're to be reminded of this Christmas is God loves you so much. He knows what you're going through and he knows the tears you're crying on your pillow. He loves you so much that he laid his whole life down for you. There's no greater love than a man laid down his life for his friend. And he wants to be your close, intimate friend. So much so he died for you. We've forgotten that, haven't we, church? Let's pray. Father, we forget that you're a person and we forget that you feel. We forget that you grieve, that you get angry, that you cry. We forget that we break your heart. We forget that you search the world over for someone whose heart is totally loyal to you. And so, Father, I pray that as we take this piece of bread that we be mindful of the tremendous love you have for us despite ourselves that you love us anyway, and that you desire to be our friend and our Lord and our King. You desire to be one with us. Forgive us for mistreating you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We were looking for that picture for you all that I was going to share with you this morning. And I found a bunch of pictures of things I'd forgotten I forgot how beautiful I was at 20. <laughs> and we found a picture of me and my wife, and she said, we must have been dating then. And we were talking, I said, yeah, no wrinkles. Look good. Look thin. Look buff. And then as I was looking at the picture, I realized we weren't dating in that picture. We were married. You know how I figured that out? Ring on my finger. You know, when, um, when you give your ring to that significant other, especially the girls, they're overcome with, most of the time, maybe not all the time, they're overcome with joy. They're excited. They look forward to that their whole life. And when you... Uh, get on one knee or however you did it and ask them to marry you they are they're blessed they are happy but how would you feel as she's going around telling her friends that you hear her say this yeah it only took two years but I finally got that diamond that's all I was after yeah it was he was going to get one of them half carrot things, but I, I made him get the carrot because that's what it's all about. Then during the entire wedding service, she's flashing the ring. Said, are we ready for pictures? No, 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 no. We don't need any pictures. I just need a picture of this. How would he feel? Hopefully he didn't say I do. That's how... I think our Heavenly Father feels when we get so bent out of shape and we don't get our way, don't get what we want, don't get our gifts because we have forgotten the heart of the one who gave so much for us. He gave us everything that he had to have a relationship. And the slightest little curveball, we go into a tailspin. Guilty. This cup is to remind you of the blood that was shed so that God could be real to you. He could walk with you and talk with you and have a relationship with you to be your Lord and Savior, but also to be your what, church? Your friend. Hopefully your best friend. But if we're honest with ourselves, if we take this cup, our kids are our best friend, our grandkids are our best friend, our spouse is our best friend, the girls we run with are our best friend, but is God our best friend? And if not, why not? We'll look at that the next message. I think it's because we don't draw near to him and spend time with him. We use him. But we don't walk with him. Let's pray. Father, forgive us. 
I fear that we're like the Israelites who worshiped you with our lips, but our hearts were far from you. Father, we pray because we're supposed to. We don't pray because we desire to talk with you. Father, we don't get frustrated that somebody's interrupted our conversation with you. Father, we don't get frustrated when we're reading our Bible that something's distracting us. Our hearts are prone to wander. And I pray that this Christmas you would draw us to yourself, that we could be like Mary. Let it be done to us according to your word, to have your promise and your presence, and that would be enough. No matter what we're facing, that you would be our best friend, that our happiness come from our relationship with you. The other things are going to leave us empty. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said.